Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we are pleased to welcome you on our, on our Innovation Inflationary Times uh, webinar. So I'm Dilshi. I'm leading the innovation expertise in Ipsos, Switzerland. And with me today, I have uh, Nolan uh, and Luis, who will be your guest speakers. So let me just introduce you to Nolan. Uh, he's di a director within uh, the innovation expertise. He has a client side uh, background and Luis on his side is uh, heading the Ipsos uh, Global modeling team, so with a lot of expertise when it comes to uh, pricing test uh, in LATAM specifically. Uh, this webinar will uh, last for 30 minutes and we have a plan for a Q&A session at the very end of the webinar, so feel free to drop uh, your questions within the chat and we'll be happy to address them. Without further delay, I'll hand it, hand it over to uh, Nolan and Luis. Thanks, Dilshi, and, and big happy birthday to you. Uh, fun way to spend your birthday, you. I think. <laughs> so we thought we would get started with a sort of a lighthearted approach um, and share this quote from Steve Blank, who has written a lot about innovation and does, does a lot about innovation out of Silicon Valley. Um, and this quote is really just a reminder that despite times being difficult and we have shocks like inflation and supply shortages, um, it's important to still invest in innovation. Innovation is a bet on the future of your business. Um, so if you take away nothing else from this webinar, print this slide out and you can show it to, to leadership anytime they try to trim or try to scale back innovation and let them know how important innovation is. But we're here to talk about inflation. Uh, so we wanted to share this information that comes from an IPSO study at the, done at the end of December. Um, and really just to share this to say that inflation is being felt across the world. So this data looks, these data look at an average of seven categories where consumers are saying that prices seem higher a lot or somewhat. And as you can see, this is South America, North America, Europe, Africa, Asia. Really inflation is being felt everywhere right now. In addition to shocks to supply chain, in addition to geopolitical events. So there's a lot of uh, turmoil going on in the world right now. And that really makes it a tough time to be an innovation manager. Um, you're faced with different decisions. Do you completely redraw your innovation pipeline? Do you accelerate or decelerate certain projects? Do you look at launching line extensions that might be a little bit more resistant to inflation? And then what's that mix between innovation and renovation? Um, also, you have to consider downsizing. So instead of taking price straight, straight to the consumer, maybe you want to change your PPA or price pack architecture. Um, and so with that, we wanted to put the, put together this webinar to really um, help at a high level you guide yourself through in, uh, inflationary times uh, as it relates to innovation. So first we'll start with uh, understanding the pricing landscape and how that matters and why that matters. And then we'll talk specifically more about tweaking and changing your innovation pipeline to be more inflation resistant. So looking back in an example from 2001 uh, to 2002 in Turkey, Turkey and Argentina, we can see that they experienced hyperinflation during this time. Um, and overall spending on food and beverage was down 17%. Uh, but if you look at specific categories, we find our, our first important point, which is that not all categories are impacted the same way. So packaged meat, for example, was down 31%, whereas packaged dairy was only impacted negative 8%. I say only, that's still quite a big impact. Um, and this is important to think about. Not all categories are hit the same way. And this is true in food and beverage. And then you can also see for personal care spending where hair care was down 16% compared to paper products down 6%. Uh, the same was also true in Argentina where uh, you can see mineral water was down a whopping 40%. So not all categories are hit the same way when inflation comes through which means it's important to think about sort of where your category is on that spectrum of inflation impact. So thinking about the elasticity of category demand, is your category a sort of must have like flour or salt, or is it something that consumers can do without? Uh, so think about scented candles, for example, that's something they don't necessarily have to buy. And then there's substitute substitutability of demand, which is quite a mouthful really. Um, are there a lot of alternatives that would provide consumers with the means to price shop or look around, swap in and out? So the example being uh, plant-based proteins versus meat proteins. Can consumers switch around those things? Um, that's also important to think about when you're thinking about your category. And then finally, also thinking about inflationary relativity. Um, 
if substitu substitutable categories are bountiful, are they also experiencing inflation in the same way? Um, are prices changing in a similar level to the category that you might be in? That's the high level category. And then within the category, there are obviously differences between segments. This is a really, really cool example um, looking at a study that was done in Southeast Asia uh, for a formula maker. And they were looking at bringing premiumization to their formulas. And what they saw is that price elasticity was actually lower for that stage one formula. So zero to six month uh, babies versus six to 12 months, one to three year or three to seven year. Um, and if you think about it, that kind of makes sense, right? So when a baby is new, zero to six months, maybe the moms are moms and dads are less willing to take a risk and they don't want to switch. Um, they really want to keep with the formula that's a known and trusted brand. Um, so this particular segment behaves a lot different than six to 12 month, one to three a year or three to seven year. And it's important to think about segment differences. Um, for this particular example, it meant that they want to invest in premium innovation at that stage one formula level versus maybe stage two, stage three, stage four, where price elasticity is higher. Um, you know, parents are switching brands, switching formula types, or potentially uh, moving on to regular food. So you can think about pricing and inflation at that category level, but also it's important to drill in and think about the segments and understand uh, where your consumers are and how they're behaving within different segments of a category. Now we'll turn it over to Lise. Thank you, Nolan. Thank you, Lishi, for inviting me to, to co-present this webinar. And thank you all and judges for finding the time to listen and to reflect about this important issue that we are living today. So uh, yeah, last year we already were talking about uh, having a very high inflation, global inflation year, and this war in Ukraine and other particular situations in one or another region, they are making this thing even a more hot topic. But before, before I get started to that, let me tell you why I'm here, because as the she presented me, I run the modeling team in charge of Ipsos Innovations in LATAM. So from very early stage tests, until very late stage forecast. But in the middle of this space, we have the optimization space. So concept optimization, line optimization, portfolio optimization, and finally price optimization. All these jobs, they pass through the hands of my team. And not only Latin American jobs, but worldwide jobs pass through us. So we're talking about uh, a couple of hundreds of models of pricing research that are run here every year. And honestly, I'm passionate about this subject and it's bad that we are talking about inflation, but I love talking about pricing. And I have been working with pricing research from PSMs to conjoints, from very theoretical models to very customized and applicable models for the last two decades at very least. And when our chief research officer, the main writer of this uh, point of view, he asked me to, to help him write this uh, uh, point of view. And I think he regrets that day because I sent him the next day like one gigabyte of information, of cases, of thoughts, of hypotheses, and in particular, some examples on how the brands should keep innovating, or how they can make their pipeline more resilient to the price increase, to inflation. So I think that's the starting point of this part of the webinar. Cool, so first things first, uniqueness differentiation, which is the key uh, one of the key drivers of, of success uh, for trial. But at Ipsos, we evaluate the potential of thousands of innovation each year. And uh, the relationship between the cost of performance and the pricing resilience are often examined as well. And if there is one performance KPI that consistently stand out and show a high correlation with price resilience is differentiation. So innovations that are very unique, that have very unique benefits, they reduce substitutability and they consistently outperform competitors when there are price increases. If you take this example on your screen right now, uh, one of our Brazilian clients is working on this instant coffee category, which in Brazil is a very commoditized and very homogenized one. And he's searching for innovation that will bring this brand out of the severe competition uh, of price and offering 
at the same time some premiumization. So after some rounds of development, we helped him to land on this very unique preposition for instant espresso. This concept of instant espresso is claiming a cafe-like experience for very indulgent occasions. And the instant coffee consumers, they have perceived this proposition as a highly differentiated one, as you can see on screen, and much less substitutable. Then finally, in the pricing test lag, as you can see in the table below, this unique proposition is revealed to have just a fraction of the price elasticity of the category leader. But it's important to notice that differentiation is key, whether we are talking about a new launch, whether we are talking about renovation. So when we see established brands bringing new news to differentiate themselves against the competition, we can also notice an increase in price resilience. In this example, this brand in analgesics, it's a leading brand in, in analgesics in the US, it has decided to relaunch, to reduce their vulnerability to a price increase that was supposed to happen very soon. So they introduced this new technology that allowed the, the brand to claim for uh, a superior absorbency and a faster action. They were hoping to set it apart from the lower priced competitors. And in the validation test, pricing test that we did, the relaunch proved to offer a significantly drop in the price elasticity of the product. So it became more resilient to price increase than the current state. And this example, this uh, actually lead us to our, our next stage, right? So we examined how our clients can use claims to make more resilient products when it comes to price resilience. But it's important to remember that during these inflationary times, our consumers, they tend to be more diligent in their choices. They tend to be more careful with the money they spend. So they need, they actually do seek more value for their money. So for this reason, they often search for products that go beyond the basic efficacy. They go, they want something that is beyond the category average so that they have a justification to pay a little bit more than the minimal or the average for a regular product. And within the innovations that we test or the propositions that we test at Ipsos, we have found several ones that make meaningful claims that are beyond the category entry requirements. And these claims helping, help increasing differentiation against competitor, competitors, and it helps them to become more price resilient as well. But there's one concept that we need to have uh, in mind, that we need to bear in mind, that is what we call permissibility to pay. Because some claims, they can definitely provide an extra boost for price resilience. But it's not all claims that are beyond the core claims are equally effective. So this term permissibility to pay, it indicates the power that different claims carry to support a price increase without losing volume. So we have conducted so many tests over the last few years uh, especially when the clients are in quest for premiumization or when they are foreseeing some price increase. And this very interesting example from a beverage company in the US, they were looking for claims to use on renovation projects that could sustain the largest price increase possible without losing volume. And in this case, the consumers, they answered the behavioral shopping exercise for beverages, and the claims were tested in a very carefully designed experiment. We tested more than 20 possible concepts or, or claims. And we noticed, we revealed that two thirds of these claims, they were not effective at all to sustain price increase. And among the few effective ones, there was one best performing that supported a 29% price increase and still kept uh, a parity in share of choice to the current status. So this huge disparity of performance of different claims, it highlights the importance of understanding the permissibility before major projects are really decided. And last but not least, downsizing. So 
Uh, this is very common to see brands reducing the size of their packs instead of increasing the pack price. It's commonly uh, called shrinkflation. You may be familiar with this term, and this may have some uh, pros and cons. That's fine. But one interesting way to increase the chances of success when you are downsizing a product is when there is some sort of renovation on top of the downsizing itself. So when we do it right, the excitement that it creates can sometimes offset completely any negative impact from the downsizing. And this is what happened in this example that we are showing right now. This uh, client from the mouthwash category in the US, uh, they downsized the bottle in about 6% of the volume. But at the same time, they have changed the pack. And it's now more modern, more fancy, more attractive, and they also uh, could uh, communicate some new functionality claims. And in this case, the consumers, they were so positively impressed by the repositioning and by the new bottle design that they paid very little attention to the reduced size. So here the relaunch could not only avoid the erosion of the share of choice, but it even achieved a small growth. And before I give the word back to Dushi, let me recognize that navigating in these times, in this inflationary time, a calm blue ocean at all. But it's not impossible either. It's challenging for sure. It requires a lot of creativity from brand managers, but there are successful stories that were born exactly in these times. And we definitely need to be accurate. Uh, there's no big margin for maneuvers, right? So on top of the creativity, we need to make use of science. We need to use the more modern techniques in pricing research that we uh, have to be accurate in our decisions. There's certainly room uh, for a right decision and a room to create a pipeline that is more resilient to price increase, to fill the gaps, uh, to minimize losses, and just like in this case, sometimes surprisingly, bring to life something that will actually lead us to growth. Right, Yushi? Right. So to summarize, if you have to keep in mind, you know, four key points uh, while leaving this uh, this webinar. First of all, is to consider your pricing landscape definitely, uh, because you need to know your consumer consumers. You need to know your targets, your segments, your category. Bringing differentiation, whether you are innovating or renovating, bring superiority through claims, uh, but it can also justify, you know, your price premium. So it's key. Um, and when downsizing, consider also that there might be uh, an offset negative impact that you need to anticipate on. So these are the key, let's say, elements that we would want you to keep in mind uh, when you are thinking about innovating uh, in inflationary times. Um, and also to uh, to remind, if you move to the next slide, that uh, it's not an easy task, uh, and innovating in these times is indeed has its shares of uh, you know unpredictability. Uh, but there is one fundamental that always remains: uh, that is to be close to our consumers, that is to be close to reality, and this is something that is embedded in the in the approaches that Ipsos uh, are are promoting. Basically, uh, should be it when we consider you know competitive benchmarks marking um, with also uh, the assessment of the level of familiarity that consumers have with their most often product, uh, be it when we want our consumers to um, mimic, you know, uh, real choices uh, in survey, be it when we are able to recreate realistic context or even when we are, uh, you know, um, accompanying you until the end of the process uh, when you, we help you, uh, you know, assess the volumes that you can get from your innovation. So so we will be happy to tell you more uh, with uh, you know in the in the in the context of a of a call or of a chat together uh, but for now the webinar is more or less over we do have some questions appearing in the chat um so first question do findings uh, differ by developed or emergent markets luis i think this one is for you I think that's because I'm Brazilian, right? Uh, because um, <laughs> maybe we have a, a lot of inflation history here. I don't know, but uh, no, thanks for addressing this question. Uh, I'm Latin American and we are discussing what we are discussing globally right now is something that is really not uh, new news here in, in our region, especially in Brazil. 
Nolan shown some figures from Argentina and Turkey, which uh, those countries, they lived a very uh, particular moment back in 2000, 2001, something like that. But in Brazil, uh, not long ago, we had two digit inflation. So last year we had two digit inflation. And back in 2015, we also had a two digit inflation. And I have worked a lot on this uh, subject uh, at that time. And uh, in that moment, with 11% uh, of uh, inflation, we had also a drop of around 9% in purchase power. That reflects that uh, people have to do more with their money. They need to stretch their money. They need to seek for value for money. They often uh, change uh, more uh, to private labels whenever possible, or they trade up to make their, their money more well spent. We saw that in, uh, in Latam as well, in Brazil as well at that moment. So to make a long story short, no, this is not focusing only on developed countries. We actually have a lot of expertise from emerging markets and also from uh, uh, developed countries. As I said, we in Latam, we work for all the globe. So we have this, um, uh, it differs from category to category, differs from country to country, but it's not something that is exclusive exclusive for one part of the globe or for another, for developed or emerging or third world or something like that. Thank you, Luis. Uh, we have another question. Um, any large watch outs to keep in mind when thinking about these strategies? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to jump in on that one. I think one of the big watch outs around downsizing is just thinking about the short term and long term effects. Um, so short term and yes, you might get a smaller pack on the shelf and it might be a good way to sort of avoid inflationary pressures, but how does that erode your brand over the long term? How do you stack up against competitors at shelf? Um, and really one of the worst things that you can do for your consumer is make them feel like they're getting taken advantage of at a time like this, right? So that's definitely one of the big watch outs with downsizing and, and really any of these strategies is just thinking about today, but also thinking about next year, two years, three years, and then the brand as well. Um, you know, how are you impacting your brand by what you're changing, um, by what you're bringing to market? So don't get too narrowly focused on the inflation and reacting right now would be probably the biggest watch out that I would say. Um, think about long term as well, which is true for all innovation, right? You should always be building in sort of a platform strategy, long term sort of horizon strategy uh, versus let's react right now to what's happening in the market. Thank you, Nolan. Uh, I see no more questions in the chat, so I think we've uh, yeah, we've come to the uh, to the end of the webinar. Uh, please note that there are two topics that our teams are working on to uh, nurture you uh, with a further you know, webinar. So on sustainability and on inclusion, uh, this should come in a month time. Uh, so stay tuned and thanks for attending. Have a nice end of the day. Thank you, Luis. Thank you, Nolan. Thanks, Sushi. Thank you.